Thank you very much, Colin, for being on the podcast today to talk with me about your new book. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to start by asking about your, what was your motivation for writing the book? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to, uh, to, to be speaking to you. Um, look, it, it, it's, uh, I would say it's something I've always wanted to accomplish. It, it's been on this list of uh, items that, that I've wanted to do. I've always, I, I've always been an avid reader. I have really loved um, writers like M Michael Lewis who can take what, what are a complicated, complicated set of factors and, and turn it into this very readable story that, that, that people get engrossed by. Um, and, and this was my attempt at that. And, um, you know, for me to, to, to be able to capture this really, you know, an extraordinary period where, you know, all of a sudden the world is thrust into a global pandemic, we have a market crash, um, and it was all perfect content for things that I know about and like to write about, which is, you know, macro trading and, and uh, you know, world events. Yeah, perfect. And it was one similarity I found. So I've read sort of the big short recently as well as Flash Boys. And it did have that sort of similar feel about, you know, the characters and how they're represented. And yeah, I think it really helps with the flow. So I, I, I could definitely see that, <laughs> the influence of Michael Lewis. Um, well, look, I, I don't think Michael Lewis has anything to, to, to fear about me encroaching on on his audience. But but I do think that it is, is a great compliment because for, for me, I, I wanted... To, to be able to weave within this story, what, what are some complicated topics? If you think about uh, quantitative easing, the role of central banks in modern economics, in the modern markets, um, you know, some of what I think are the sources and causes of the, the you know, the, the wealth inequality and, and how the data has changed in that regard over the last decade. Um, and, you know, I, I, I would say that if, if I just wrote about those topics and I called the book, you know, the history of quantitative easing, you know, I, I don't think anyone would read it. It just wouldn't be interesting, you know, maybe for nerds like me. Um, but, but to be able to wrap these types of topics into a story where it all flows um, was, was, was a real challenge for me, but, but that was the exciting bit. You know, in, in the course of my you know, real day job, which is uh, as a global macro investor and running global macro businesses, I, I've, you know, over the course of my career, I've always written market commentaries and investor letters, things like that. But I've never had the challenge of had, needing to, to build characters and, and being able to tell a story in the same way. And I, I found that project to, to, to be really fun and kind of exercising some of um, the creative side of my mind that, that I haven't used in quite some time. Yeah, perfect. And I guess we'll take a, take a step back. Um, Basically, the book follows a macro trader during the volatility of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and sort of probably many readers may have never experienced a sort of a true bear market before because it's been sort of 12 years. Uh, so can you explain to us how COVID was different to the past recessions? And I know you mentioned in the book as well. Yeah, look, I, I, I think it's fascinating. And I, I, think, I think it's really important um, in, in one regard, which I'll circle back to. But, but COVID was this external shock to consumption. But essentially, the world economy shut down over a period of something like 90 days, um, which, which is just you know, such, such an, an amazing shock when you think of the enormity of it. You know, when, when we, over that period, when you were looking at the data, it, it was unbelievable. It, 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 these were, you know, the, the levels at which economic activity dropped off were things that we have never seen before in history, at least in over the time that this data is being recorded, which is quite a bit different from, you know, the, the, the global financial crisis in the 2008 period or, you know, earlier periods of recession. Which, which in many ways followed more normal business cycles where you, know, you have a period where the, the economy overheats, a bubble bursts, um, maybe there's been a buildup of credit or something else like housing in the US in the 2008 type of bu bubble. 
but here it was everything all at once. And what, what, why, that, why I do think that that's interesting is that the way that policymakers have learned to deal with all of these problems is really from the same playbook. It is a combination of fiscal spending, uh, loose monetary policy, quantitative easing. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really fascinating to see because each of these shocks to, to the system, you know, it doesn't really give rise to a one size fits all type of solution. And I think that policymakers need to be able to think about things a bit more discreetly and to, to be able to refine their own response to these types of problems. Because if, if we don't do these things, what we end up doing is just piling up more and more debt on top of things, um, which at some point in time is leveraging our futures. You know, the, the, this debt does need to be repaid at some point in time. Yeah, perfect. And that links perfectly to my next question. So, you know, as you said, quantitative easing was a very prominent theme throughout the book. And uh, you mentioned as well that it, it doesn't benefit the actual real economy. It's more focused on sort of assets and um, government debt as well. So um, I know you mentioned a few problems there, but what other problems do you think QE brings? Yeah, well, it, at least in my opinion, and, you know, th there are a lot of people who are more prominent and much smarter than I am, who I think would echo these comments. But it, at least in my opinion, we're at a stage now where QE really only props up asset values. And I'm talking about things like stocks, bonds, you know, now we're seeing that, that flow, flow into housing. Um, but there re really isn't any real credit expansion. There, there's no real benefit for the real economy. And what ends up happening at the end of the day is that these low rates end up being a tax on traditional savers, uh, for the benefit of borrowers, because we, we, we end up in a world where it, it's just a debt fuel type of economy. And, you know, the, the, one of the very negative consequences to that in my mind is that, you know, the, the middle really, the, the middle class really gets, gets gutted due to, you know, lower expected wages, a hit on savings, but th that collection of, of consequences is not good is, is not good for the middle class, which I think is really important for any modern economy to, to have a thriving middle class where, you know, the benefits of economic growth don't disproportionately go to the top 1%. You know, that things need to be more evened out, more, more, more fair, you know, across the board. Yeah, I think that's what we've definitely seen in the pandemic is sort of, they, I don't know, they call it the K recovery, where yeah. the, the top of the top recover a lot quicker than Everyone at the bottom. Yeah, and look, it, th th this is something um, that even even the Fed, the Federal Reserve, has studied. You know, it, it's a dynamic they call the superstar economy, which is the, the fact that you know fewer and fewer are taking more and more. And the COVID, the, the pandemic, really accelerated that, really kicked that into high gear. Where if you look at the people that really benefited from the wealth transfer that happened over that that period of time um it disproportionately went to the, the the very top of the of the income spectrum yeah perfect and i think you mentioned the fed there and that sort of leads on to my next question so i think the fed and all economists uh their favorite word recently has been transitory um and you know with the expansion of both fiscal and monetary policy spending um as well as sort of we've seen quite surprising data the past few days of PPI, CPI, uh, unemployment jobs. Uh, so do you see inflation also being more of a bit permanent phenomena? And that sort of also attacks on the middle class as well, because if wages don't grow, then obviously they're missing out. A a a absolutely. Um, look, it, inflation is the specter that everyone will need to worry about right now. Um, you, you mentioned CPI, PPI. Uh, both of those prints, which have happened over, you know, just over the course of this week, uh, look like complete outliers. You know, you, you see the largest spike that's ever been recorded. Now, it is important to, to remember that, um, you know, the, the spike in large part is due to the very significant moves down in prices a year ago, uh, which affects the, 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 the base in 12-month change calculations. 
Um, but looking over over you know a smoothing over a two year period, you know we are seeing inflation, you know at at r- right r- right around two percent. Um, what what is particularly scary about this right now though is that, you know. As you said, you know the, the Fed has been you know quite convinced that this is quote transitory, um, but inflation is a little bit different than other types of economic data. And and what I mean by that is that there's a stickiness associated with inflation based on inflation expectations. So if people expect that inflation is going to continue to go higher. It usually does. It's sort of like a momentum stock that way, where where once it begins to move higher, uh, it, it it generally doesn't doesn't then just revert back to the mean. And if you look over the past ten years, you know I, I think even the Fed would have to admit this, but they have you know chronically mis mis modeled inflation expectations. I think it's something that the central banks are are having a very difficult time understanding right now. So you have an incredible amount of uncertainty about you know what the end game looks like. And the fact that you know this is something that has been chronically mismodeled. So you know the the, the Fed's own credibility with regard to inflation I think is is you know at a low point. Um, it, it's very dangerous, but I think it's it's very it, it's hard for them just to say it's transitory. Don't worry about this because inflation can be incredibly damaging to the economy, to the middle class, as you mentioned, um, and it is a scary phenomenon. Yeah, definitely. I, I think it's something that a lot of us haven't really seen. You know, I don't, you know, I've never seen in my life very high inflation. Probably haven't seen it for at least fifteen years, let alone you know, thirty or forty. Um, for other people but so someone who's mentioned the book uh, and is very successful investor is Ray Dalio um, and he, he's been talking recently about and sort of links into inflation and the, the massive debt that's being approved by the government he's been talking about uh, sort of the end of a debt cycle and that's what he's, he's seeing in, in the economy uh, do you sort of have similar thoughts to him about the situation that I know you mentioned in the book that it's just getting too big and too big and there's no way we'll be able to repay it well yeah and I, I would tend to agree with him on this point. You know, in the book, the, there is a scene where um, the, the this team of hedge fund traders is in Las Vegas and in a limousine uh, cruising down the Las Vegas Strip, and they notice that there's a billboard on the Vegas Strip which measures uh, the, the U.S. government debt, and, you know, it's the IOU. And at that time, at the time of writing, which was, uh, you know, call it last last March, um, you know, that number stood at $23 trillion. And if you look today, you know, that number is at $29 trillion. So, you know, we've added $6 trillion to the amount of money that we owe in a very, very short period. I, I think, I think what, what's incredibly frightening about this is, is if, if we thought that, that interest rates in the United States could ever normalize. So, you know, say that the 10-year bond went to 5%, which is a you know, fairly modest increase. Um, that, that would mean that it would cost us nearly 30% of GDP just to service the debt on, on the, the interest on the debt that we owe. It, it's an unsustainable amount, which means that that debt in more traditional ways can never be repaid. What what we will have to do is inflate our way out of that, and and or it's a combination of the Fed continuing to monetize that debt, meaning that as debt becomes due as it matures, the the, the U.S. Treasury needs to issue more bonds. The Fed has to buy those bonds because other people won't without there being a spike in interest rates. And they will do that with, with you know, newly created currency. It's, it's something called you know, debt monetization. And that's really the only way out of this mess now, which, which is pretty incredible because, again, the consequences of that can be very extreme. You know, the U.S. Has, has benefited from being the world's reserve currency, something that... Um, People like Barry uh, Eichengreen and others call the exorbitant privilege. Um, but if that status were to ever end, um, you know, th- this would be just just a, a, a disaster for the U.S. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's something that 
Well, obviously, we've seen the devaluation of the US dollar over the past few months. And it's similar to sort of inflation, isn't it? We'll see if it sticks or if it can bounce back. Um, Look, yeah. th th there's, on, on that point, th there's a reason that, you know, the euro, uh, GBP have all been trading trading stronger. It, it, it's that, you know, the, the US dollar is in this cycle of weakening right now. Yeah, I think we saw it after the uh, GFC as well, but uh, I remember Australian, you know, I'm from Australia, and the dollar, I couldn't believe it. it was sort of twice the value in 2010, yep. 2011 than it was in 2008. But um, yep. I guess it just exactly. depends if we get that cycle. Yep. Cool, perfect. So um, sort of the book, um, as I said before, it's and you've mentioned it's sort of influenced by Michael Lewis. And one thing I noticed is it's at a very frantic pace, sort of, uh, you know, boss who's the uh, sort of the lead character, his life at Macro Trader just seems mad. So uh, is that an accurate representation of the life as a Macro Trader? Um, in, in terms of the 24-7 nature of a Macro Trader, yeah, I think it's very similar to the demands of, of being in that spot. I would say that where the book probably captures and caters a bit to, to the reader's imagination is I, I don't know if you would see quite as much uh, travel and partying and, and things like that. I would say that uh, macro traders as a whole are a pretty serious lot. They, they need to be. But it, it, it is an incredibly de demanding um, type of role in, in that things can change so quickly. And, um, you know, your, your, your trading, your positions are always influenced by world events. So th there's a scene in the book where I talk about this, but, you know, maybe the, the Bank of Jama Japan has done something in the middle of the night or, you know, wh whatever it may be, but that can certainly impact you in, when you're, you know, supposed to be sound asleep. Uh, but it, it was very intentional. I wanted people to, under, to understand this frenetic type of pace in life and, and just, uh, j just the rigors of, of that. Yeah, and just always having to be on, just because obviously if you, if you miss something, that could be devastating. There's, a, there's a, w w one of the individuals that has covered me for many, many years has a famous saying. He starts off his day by saying, Every day is like the Super Bowl in our business. And in a lot of ways, he's right. You know, every day you have to come prepared, um, ready to do your job in, in a very disciplined way. It, it's very rare to have a true day off. Yeah, perfect. And we'll um, sort of go back to something that you mentioned in the book, and it, it really stuck with me, was sort of the five-step process for being a successful trader. Uh, so can you explain this process? And is this something that sort of you personally follow? Yeah, it, 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 it is. Look, I, I think, I think it's incredibly important. There, there to, to me, there, there are no shortcuts, um, to, to be great at this. And, and if you look at, you know, some of the, the icons of the macro business that, that I mentioned in the book, people like Paul Tudor Jones or Lewis Bacon or, you know, Alan Howard at Brevin Howard, uh, Stan Druckenmiller, you know, George Soros. You know, we, what, what they do for a living is just so extraordinarily hard, you know, year in, year out, to always, to always generate absolute returns. And I think it comes down to that process. It, it takes, you know, there's the famous quote that, you know, you need to do something for 10,000 10, hours to be proficient at that. And, and that, that's just a starting point for this business because you have to have that 10,000 hours into this business to, to really hone your own investment strategy. But it's also critically important to, to think about yourself, your style of risk-taking, how you've been impacted by past events, um, any types of, of cognitive bias that you may hold that can hold you back or impact your decision-making. Um, you know, b having clarity of decision making and making good decisions all day long where you feel the odds are in your favor is a really critical part of managing money in this type of fashion. You know, th th there's something called VBT, values-based training that, you know, I believe in a great deal where, you know, you're really trying to create this heightened level of self-awareness about yourself so you can understand, you know, the, the decisions that, that you're making. And then, you know, to me, it's very important to have a great type of routine or ritual around, um, around all of this. You know, I, I tend to be a bit um, on the uh, OCD side where I like things set up the same way and, 
you know, maybe, you know, it, it's good to have that kind of game day routine to make sure that you're mentally ready to, 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 to attack the markets and, and to make great decisions. Yeah, perfect. And I like how you met, it's sort of similar, as you said, to sports and the Super Bowl and that high performance mentality of just every day, it's almost like game day, you got to prepare the same to perform. Every day is game day. And that, that goes to keeping yourself healthy, following a great, you know, routine to um, keep your mind clear, your body healthy. Uh, you know, all of these things are important because, you know, m maybe you can cut corners around some of these things at certain periods of time. But if you do, you'll shorten your career, you know, just like a professional athlete. You know, if you think about the routine that Tom Brady, you know, a, a famous quarterback has in terms of what he does and how disciplined he is to continue to generate these results, it's the same. You, you need to really really have that discipline and focus to stay at the top of your game for as long as possible. Yeah, perfect. And so sort of linking to, to your, your own trading, your own investing. So do you have a strategy you follow sort of when analyzing an asset to trade? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. We, we analyze just an incredible amount of data. Um, you know, I've always been very fortunate in my businesses to have you know, significant teams. So I have um, great resources around me to, 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 to have the ability to leverage my own time and abilities. Um, but it is always, you know, attempting to stay one step ahead of the markets. Um, you know, not thinking about today, but thinking about three months from now or one month from now and how the world is likely to change and to find what's mispriced in, in that because you know, markets tend to be you know, incredibly efficient in today and, and sort of front running the events that it expects to happen. Um, but but you, know, you can still find you know, these mispriced types of opportunities uh, when, when you're thinking about the forward looking nature of the world. And that's the key to global macro. It's finding that, that unpriced uh, type of, of, of event that you think is more likely to happen than the people around you. Yeah, perfect. And then I think also, would you say being prepared in case something just changes? So just being prepared to unravel. And I know you've in the book it happens as well, but they just have to unravel positions just because of what happens. Yeah, look. It's it, it, it's a thing, you know. These these black swan events, you know, the hundred year floods, seem to be happening with seem to be happening with a higher and higher degree of frequency, and so you know you can never say, oh, that'll never happen. You know, that that that's a one percent type of likelihood. Um, the the world changes really quickly, and you have to always be prepared for that. Yeah, and you mentioned it there that um, some of the models, uh, one of the characters was very focused on models and they just couldn't actually process the data quick enough to sort of analyze what was happening and the risk involved. Yeah, no, I, and I, I think it's one of the reasons, you know, you're, you're exactly right. And the, the book focuses on that. And th there was a period of time during COVID where the models didn't matter anymore because what, you know, the, the, the historical data patterns, these things, that was all out the window. You know, this was a brand new world and you need to adopt to find, okay, what is the relevant data now? So, you know, in the book, we talk about some of the higher frequency data that I think was probably more meaningful in that period. So all of a sudden you're looking at, well, what's happening to hotel reservations or, carry out food delivery or, you know, the, this real-time data that maybe, you know, was getting you a better signal of what was to come. But it's, it's always adapting to the world around you and not, you know, relying on something that is no longer relevant. And, you know, to, to bring this back to the Fed, I think that that's something that makes their jobs in a period like this just extraordinarily difficult, which is, you know, their models are based on much longer cycles. And all of a sudden you have this type of, of external shock to the system and what do you do about it? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard thing. Yeah, I think this, this time we did see them react a lot quicker than I guess you compare to the GFC. Um, and I guess that's what I think may happen in the future that it's just we'll have quicker shocks with quicker responses. And I don't know, I guess, I guess we'll see if that's effective hopefully. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely.
that, that's the issue. So um, sort of one thing as well as mentioned, so macro strategy funds, that they, they did obviously struggle after the GFC just because of uh, quite a lot of stability. So um, you mentioned there that we're seeing a lot more sort of 100-year floods and a lot more black swans. Do you sort of see uh, the increased volatility and global uncertainty, cre uncertainty creating a resurgence in macro strategy? Yeah, I, 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 I do. I, I think we're back into a very strong period for macro investing. Um, look, in, in, if you look at the markets today, you know, the, the markets over the last 12 months became too easy. You know, I, I can't get into an Uber or a taxi these days without the driver telling me about his success in this stock or this, this type of uh, cryptocurrency or whatever it is. Yeah. And whenever the markets become too easy, I become really worried because that markets are never intended to be easy. This is a very hard thing to outperform the markets over time. And it tells me that we are in for much more volatility going forward. And if you think about where we sit now in terms of uh, the end to the type of, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the end to the pandemic period. So we're in a period based on, with all the fiscal stimulus that we have, where we're going to create an economy that overheats, and then the Fed will need to react to that. Uh, but I think going into next year is going to be one of these um, more more extraordinary periods. And if you think of just about some of the upcoming catalysts, you know, we're going to see uh, GDP uh, above seven percent. You're going to see inflation run very hot. The Fed is going to have to announce a tapering of activity. The market is going to price additional rate hikes into the curve. Uh, across Europe, we'll get things like the French election next year. Um, but all of these are catalysts for change. I, I think it's going to be an amazing period for macro. As, as I, I, I say in the book, uh, macro is back. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, so, so for sort of for people like myself who are students looking to pursue a career in sort of macro strategy or, or finance, what would you recommend for us? Like how would, what would be the things to do to get into the industry? Well, to, to, to me, it's just the, the passion for the business. It's the passion for the markets. Um, you know, what, one of the interesting things about this type of business is, you know, you can walk into your local, you know, store and find, a, you know, a, a number of books to buy on how to do bond math or fundamental securities uh, 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 analysis. But there really isn't something that says, how do you become a global macro portfolio manager? And I think it's a lot of it is that that self-interest, it's that desire to learn, to, to understand how these different asset classes all intersect and relate back to each other and how interest rates impact uh, foreign exchange and vice versa and what that means for equity markets, credit markets, volatility. Uh, but I think that the best... Um, uh, people in the business, and the best way to get into this business is just to have this, um, ha have that passion to, to to want to learn, to have that open mind, and to 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 jump into things. Yeah, I guess there's so much information out there these days that it's just, you know, if you don't do it yourself, then I guess that's there's other people who are, as you said, who are passionate. You know. I, 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 I agree with that. All of the types of data that, that you know, we tend to look, look at are all publicly available now. That's a huge change over the last 10 years. Even on Twitter, there, there are, there's a huge community, community of people, the you know, thin twit groups and things that you know, they're always sharing macro views and commentary. And um, you know, th th there's, there's a lot of smart people who are offering their own insights, advice, views on the market in, in, a, much, in a much easier way to access than, than ever before. And people should take advantage of that. Yeah, and then so one thing as well that brings is sort of a lot of, a lot of white noise. You know, there's so much information, it's hard to know. So would you recommend just finding people that you trust and sort of following them or how would you go through the white noise? I do. I, I think um, there is a lot of white noise. Um, there are a lot of things that just don't matter. And, you know, we, we are all limited by time. And I do think it's, it's important to always be exploring for new trusted sources of information, but not, not taking on too much because you can just dilute down your own time, your own abilities, your own conviction. Um, and th th this goes back to that 10,000 hours that you need to spend to hone your craft. 
but it's really building a process that you have conviction in, that you know that works, that gives you, um, you know, better than 50-50 than odds at any point in time. Uh, and once you're able to do that, then it's a, it's a matter of continuing to improve that, looking for, again, new bona fide trusted sources of information, of data, and in, in adding those to the process, but, but without diluting yourself down with just, just the noise and the, the, the next headline. Yeah, and I guess that's a challenge, isn't it? So um, yes. on, to our, on to my last question. So what, what would be the one message you'd like people to sort of take away from the book? Well, I, um, I hope people are able to take away the passion that I have for the markets. I hope that this, that this um, makes them really interested in global macro. But I also hope that people understand the dangers of the current policy path that we're on in terms of wealth inequality and some of these bigger social issues, because I do think that they're incredibly important. A lot of times people couch the wealth inequality issue in more of a political framework. And this book re really tries to show that it's a monetary policy phenomenon as well. And, and there's dangers to that. And you know, some of what we've seen in terms of you know, the rise of populism and you know, some of the other you know, social issues that we're having, I do believe are a consequence of that. And people need to understand what, 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 what the cause and effect of these policies really is. That is one interesting thing that even though, you know, there's obviously been Democrats and Republicans uh, over the past 15 years, it's, it hasn't changed the, what's happening. It's still sort of being rich getting more and the poor getting less, unfortunately. It, it, yeah, it's really not blue against red or anything else. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned this in the book, but I really view this as a bit of a, an attack on our overall ethos, on the concept of the American dream and it, it's important that, you know, for the U.S. that, that we don't lose that, you know, the, this, this concept of an American dream, because it's a really important thing. Right, perfect. So, Colin, so if he wanted to get your book, would it the best place be Amazon or there is, is there anywhere else? Uh, you can buy this at all of the major book distributors, um, including Amazon or directly from Harriman House, who has been my publisher. Uh, but if you do a quick Google search for Fed Up by Colin Lancaster, you'll find plenty of places to, to, to be able to, to purchase the, the book. Right, perfect. So Colin, thank you very much for talking with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. It's been a pleasure.